Creating a brand is all about tapping into human psychology. It's about adding an intangible desire to a product. By creating a set of associations in the consumer's mind and having distinctive assets that trigger those associations time after time, a successful brand significantly improves the odds of being bought. Packaging design should seduce, inform, and even save the planet. I'm Hernan Braverman, and this is Branderman, the podcast where I talk with experts to uncover what it actually takes to make a positive impact on consumers, the market, and society. Warning, keep this podcast out of the reach of close-minded marketers and designers. Before the interview, let me introduce my design agency. Brands with purpose. Human, agile, honest brands that leave no one indifferent. Tridimage creates and revitalizes brands to imagine and shape the future. Tridimage, the branding and packaging design agency for bold brands. To redesign or not to redesign? That is the question. Today I had the pleasure to speak with Steve Osborne, a British brand design specialist with over 30 year experience creating, repositioning and extending brands through package design. Steve is managing partner at Osborne Pike, a design studio based in the lovely city of Bath. His career started in marketing at Unilever before he switched sides to join Design Bridge. After playing a leading role in that agency development, including seven years as founder and managing director of the Amsterdam office, he set up Osborne Pike in 2002. In this episode, we analyze the biggest mistakes brands make when redesigning their packages. He tells me what packaging storytelling can achieve. Finally, he describes the qualities that a package design should have to stand the test of time and be distinctive. Today with me, Steve Osborne. Each of us is a container of ideas, projects, and dreams. However, we can't read the label when we are inside the jar. What do you think your label says, or what would you like it to say? I feel a little bit like a brand, you know, sending out signals, hoping that it gets the correct interpretation. It's always felt to me like brands are things I really understand very well and intuitively. Uh, I know what they're trying to say. I can feel the way that the pieces of the brand, the words, pictures, sounds, and all the associations that those things bring, I kind of feel that I can understand brands and therefore I find it easy to help brands say what they're trying to say better or maybe work out something better to say. So I've just always felt very comfortable in the space of branding. And so I wrote a very simple label. I think I've really got a t-shirt. So my t-shirt says, hello, I'm Steve and I speak brand. That's great. As it has something to do with having studied chemistry, I feel that sometimes when you speak or when you write, you have this kind of scientific perspective. Oh yeah, oh yeah, well, that's certainly true. I definitely do have a scientific approach, but luckily for me, the science of branding, the science of communication, the science, the neuroscience, the, the science of how the brain operates, it's pretty exciting right now. It's a lot of new stuff is being researched and published. And we know a lot more now about how the brain works. So we can have very different ways of thinking about how brands work. So actually being a scientist in branding is getting even more relevant in a way. I think psychology, which is the science we're really talking about here, is still a very sort of soft and, and quite fuzzy science. And even though the neuroscientific advances are massive, they still leave a lot of puzzles unanswered. We still haven't made a complete map of all of our neurons, and we don't quite know exactly what's going on when we say the brain lights up here, and the brain does this, and the brain does that. And, and obviously, for the sake of humanity and enjoying our work, I hope it probably never gets fully complete, because if we don't leave anything unknown for us to fill in with creativity, then the world will be a very strange place, I think. So as a scientist, I'm very happy to be able to solve like, you know, 80, 90% of the things we can know about the human brain and how brands are going to influence it. But I'm also very happy to leave the 10% unknown so that we can use the mystery, if you like, of, of the creative process to make that bit work. Because I think we all know this as well. If you have a very, very rational brief, you end up with a very rational answer and no one particularly likes it. 
you know, this missing, it's got no real soul. It's got no real spark. It's got no real pleasure. It's just what you expected. And you go, well, that kind of works. But nobody wants something that just kind of works, especially not in branding. So I think I'm very much a fan, if you like, of the missing 10%. And that's the bit that really gives us all the pleasure. And that's the bit that we should keep. But I love the fact that I can get closer to that happening by ruling out dead ends and just by getting reasonably close to the answer by thinking logically and scientifically. How was the path that led you from studying chemistry, then working as a brand manager at Unilever, then managing Design Bridge Amsterdam office to founding Osborne Pike? <laughs> yeah, that, that, is, that is my entire career. I did chemistry because I loved the subject at school and I had a great teacher. Certainly after like five years, I realized that I didn't want to do chemistry for a career because you could spend your life in a lab. I, I didn't do this consciously, but I read later on, uh, much later on actually, that you should always do for a career the thing that you really loved when you were about eight years old. And this did not guide me consciously in my next decision, but I remember really loving advertising. I was glued to advertising. I, I couldn't really tell you why. It, it just sort of, again, spoke to me, I suppose. And so actually, as a PhD chemist, I then started applying in the middle of a session for jobs in advertising. And, and that didn't work out so well. So I couldn't get into advertising. But I did manage to get into marketing. But I didn't get the level of management of the advertising process I was expecting. As a junior brand manager, I was the fifth one to speak. And by that time, all the decisions had been made. But actually, I discovered this other thing, which was that there was a whole area of people devoted to redesigning packaging. And I didn't really think about that before. And then I got the job early on in my career to redesign the packaging of this brand that I was working on. And that, that was a really enjoyable process. It was something I was a given more, I wouldn't say full control, but I was given more authority than the ads. And it, it was also highly creative and really much operating in, in a similar kind of way. It doesn't have the kind of sex appeal and, and showbiz appeal of, of advertising because of the budgets and the fact that you were going to see people acting and being on television and stuff like that. But So it wasn't quite as glamorous, but I, I found it just as interesting from an intellectual point of view, I guess. And so I started to become quite interested in that. And this was in the 1980s, the late 80s, when there was a big surge in interest in branding and, and packaging as, as a field. Um, by that time, I was already in the branding world because I joined Design Branding bridge in 87. So after four years as a client, I, I suddenly had the opportunity of joining what was actually a startup agency. There were only 15 people when I joined. But yeah, it was a, it was a great place to start your career because A, it was a startup and B, it was growing rapidly. And it had a lot of really, really interesting people running it you know, to learn from. So it was like a, a rocket with a lot of boosters. And it, it took off and I was promoted and got to the board in London and then I was posted to set up the office in, in Amsterdam. Uh, I went to live in Amsterdam for seven years and eventually my wife joined me. She was my girlfriend, of course, at the time, and, and we had our kids in Amsterdam. So it became our second home and still is really. I think it's a very easy society to go and work in, very open. I ran that side of it, the Dutch office, for another seven years uh, before setting up uh, Osborne Pike. What wisdom have you gained in the process of managing both large and small design studios or a big agency in a small package, as you like to call Osborne Pike? <laughs> If I'm honest, um, when I left Design Bridge in Amsterdam, it was 25 people. So it wasn't that big. It was, you know, manageable numbers. I, I've read a lot about scaling agencies and certain sizes and what that means for management systems and how to run them. So I think, to be honest, I've only ever really run small-ish agencies. I kind of feel that the ideal agency, I mean, we're, we're growing at the moment at OP, we're currently 16, but we expect to be 20 or, or 25 uh, in the not too distant future. And that's a nice size. It's a nice number. You can see everything that's going on, but you don't have to do everything. Where you have a good team of people around you who are running parts of the business or certain clients or certain parts of the operation. I, I, I like the size we are now, and I, I can see that lasting for quite a long time in terms of growth in the future. But there is a limit. There is a limit when it gets to be a little bit too much the business driving you rather than you driving the business, maybe a bit political. I really hate politics. That's why I got out of the corporate world. I could see that people spent half their time making the right calls in terms of being nice to the right people. And I just did not get that. I think my scientific brain just said, well, that doesn't make sense. When I realized that half of your job was being nice to the right people, I, I just really couldn't get that. And, and I wasn't very good at it. So I moved to a small agency, which quickly became a fairly big agency, but I managed to move away to start another small agency within the big agency. 
And eventually when that got to a size where it was about to take off to become quite a lot bigger, I certainly wasn't the person for that. And so I started another small agency, this one for myself. And at the same time, I came back to the UK because I needed a business partner. And by that time, David was back in the UK. So um, back to the UK it was. And uh, yeah, that's what we did 19 years ago, almost. Wow. What's one thing you wish you had known when you started Osborne Pike? <laughs> um, yeah, it's a good question. I mean, to be honest, for many years, I didn't have to ask that question because the big agency in a small package idea came from the fact that inside a big agency, there's only so many people that you can put on a project or a pitch before it gets weighed down by weight of opinion. So actually, even in big agencies, it's small teams that win and run projects. So as long as you've got people with experience in the room, you don't need an awful lot of them. We're very successful for many years with the mantra that we are a big agency in a small package. We can play against big agencies because you only need three or four people with the same skill set. You don't have to have a massive entourage of extra potential, extra brain power. But all too often, that doesn't quite work out like that. It just confuses things or makes things last longer or cost more. I felt I didn't have much to learn in the early days. But yeah, I guess I should have realized that it wasn't going to stay like that forever unless I thought about structure and strength in depth and bringing in new partners. I think I probably did that too late and thought I could run it myself with a, a small team for too long. I think I should have built the team faster. That, that's probably the one thing I wish I knew uh, at the time that I certainly know now. <laughs> How has your vision of packaging design evolved? Do you think your perspective has changed over the years? Yeah, it has. And I think that's very much related to the question about the science. I've always been interested in that psychology angle. Why do brands affect people's behavior so much? And how, how do they do that? You know, is it the advertising? Is it the packaging? Is it the branding? How is that working? And I read about this subject all the time. I think what led in the end to the success of How Brands Grow, the book and the consultancy, and the fact that this is proper science applied to marketing, not the science I know from chemistry, but simple economics in a way, just looking at what happens in terms of literally answering the question, how do brands grow? I very much welcome that approach to actually having some data and some science behind rather than just people's ideas, because it has been a very difficult area to understand. And I think, I think they're still a bit missing. You know, I think How Brands Grow can report the data and say, this is what happens. And therefore, these are the things that we think drive that. And I agree with all that. I, I agree. It's definitely physical and mental availability, totally buy all that. But there is a kind of an X factor where you can have all of those things, but one brand can still perform five times better than another. And explaining that isn't something you find in those studies. So we have to explain that. And that's the area that I've probably thought most about over my career. I'm fascinated about early thinking on how advertising work, but I, I'm absolutely convinced by the work of, of Marshall McLuhan in that brand communication for me, whether it's advertising or anything else, is definitely a subconscious element. The idea that people are actually listening to our messages and rationally responding to them and acting on that is a fiction. And it's a fiction that's been very eloquently described by Paul Feldwick. And he calls it the benign conspiracy, which is a lovely term, which basically says that for all of its existence, advertising or marketing services in general have measured things that you can't really measure because it then gives us the excuse that we run a rational industry, a rational business that is only telling people valuable information. It's not trying to sell them something that they're not even aware they're being sold. Because that's been a huge fear of the industry since the its early days, since 100 years ago. It was going to be legislated against if it was felt that it was working through trickery, through all, all of the stuff that was going on in the late 50s, you know, partly probably driven by the Cold War and stuff like that. But advertising was in deep fear that it would be kind of banned if people thought it worked subconsciously. People didn't like the idea of the subconscious being evoked at all. That was the place of bad dreams and Freudian fantasies. You know, that's not what you want to say if you walk into a client and say, hey, I, I'm from advertising agency X, you know, I want to sell your brand for several million dollars a year. You don't do that. You say that it's a part of the business process. It works with rational, logical business type rules. And that's what you sell. So selling advertising had to deny the existence of all the subconscious stuff. Um, and that's what the benign conspiracy is. The agencies kind of know it doesn't work like that. But the official line is that, yeah, this is all rational stuff. And we even measure the rational stuff. We ask consumers if they would buy stuff. We ask them what they think of our brand. We invent things like love brands. And all this stuff was proven to be pretty much mythical by how brands grow. 
It's much simpler than that and much more basic than that. But understanding the neuroscience isn't easy. What do I do if I want to sell more stuff? I'm endlessly fascinated by that whole discussion around how your brain works, how messaging works. And I've done so much reading in that area now. I, I, I kind of feel I do know how it all works, but it's still hard to just snap together the perfect brand. That doesn't, <laughs> doesn't easily happen. It's definitely not what you say, but the things that are working around what you say, the things that are not the message, what we call meta communication. I'm a, a firm believer that in advertising and packaging and branding, any kind of messaging, the messaging is there and people kind of register it, but they're not really listening. The stuff that's doing the hard work, the heavy lifting is the subliminal, the meta communication. And that's why packaging is so clever because nobody thinks it's advertising. Nobody thinks it's sending you any messages. It just is. It contains the product, right? So wh why would I think of it as an advert? I'm not going to raise objections to what it's telling me because it's not telling me anything. Of course, it tells you what's in it and it has a name and it has some nice design, but nobody thinks of that as communication. They think of that as just design, right? But design is communication. It's just working very, very effectively, subconsciously, giving you all kinds of associations, which your brain is going, hey, that's one of those. And hey, that's one of those. And hey, I like those <laughs> things. And hey, and then before you know it, you're buying it. And it is subconscious. And it would have been illegal if people could discover that it was subconscious before we knew how the subconscious actually worked and that nearly everything we do is subconscious. So actually, once you accept that we are not as we think we are, you know, we think we have agency, we think we make up all our own decisions, we don't realize how the brain really works. And once you realize that, you have to accept that a lot of things are subconscious, including pretty much all of marketing. So live with it and then work with it. And I think that kind of deeper knowledge about how things work allowed how brands grow not just because it had measured the numbers and said, look, this is what the, the market share is telling us. This is what the volume sales are telling us. So why are you still working with opinion rather than fact? But I think this idea that we can now believe in the subconscious rather than the rational, the emotional rather than the rational, helps us to understand the message that How Brands Grow is telling us, really, which is that it's simpler than that. People aren't listening to you. People don't care about your brand. People are just trying to remember which one it was. And the whole thing about mental availability is, please just keep telling me what it is, how to say it, what it looks like, what color it is. And that will give me a lot of help as a consumer because then I won't forget it. What qualities must a designer have to stand the test of time and be distinctive? It, it, it can have a lot of things. It, it fundamentally just has to look different from everything else. But of course, you have to do that within certain parameters. So there are categories, there are brands in that category. And yeah, I mean, the, the easiest way to stand out is to zig when everybody else zags. Now that can be done through the branding and packaging. It can be done through the advertising or both, but you just can't be different for the sake of it. You need to be different in a relevant way. So standing out is just looking different to the pack. And there's an awful lot of kind of coming together in categories. Things start to look more and more similar. So being different, going against the tide, being zigging when they zag is not the easiest thing to do. And you've got to do it within the historical context of your brand. A lot of design crimes have been committed in the name of just being different for the sake of it, right? or being modern for the sake of it. I think standing out is being unexpected, making people's heads turn, seeing something they didn't expect, but doing all of that within the context of category. So you don't look too alien. What the hell is it? You don't want to go there. And the brand has a history. And yes, the brand may be suffering from a little bit of a lack of standout. So you need to work with what you have when you want to make it have more standout, not suddenly turn it the opposite color or make the logo in a new typeface. You don't do those things, but there are plenty of ways you can make something stand out without having to throw out the baby with the bathwater. And I think that's what most of the design crimes that were committed before How Brands Grow came along. They just said, hey, the world has changed. We want young consumers. Let's change everything. Nobody likes this brand, bang, brand new. And I think there are times you can do that when you really have nothing of value. But if the brand is out there for any significant amount of time, it's got some people remembering some aspects of it. So I think You have to stand out. You absolutely have to stand out. In a way, that's easier for a new brand, but you have to play by some of the rules of the category. You can't get people going, what, what, what is that? Or just ignoring it. So it's a balance, but a lot of new brands are as guilty of clustering around each other as existing ones. Sometimes the category starts to look similar and it's all the old brands doing it, but quite often it's the new ones as well. They, they all want to talk to millennials or Gen Z on Instagram. And that has a certain look, which makes all these brands look quite similar. Brand value is everything people know and feel that attracts them to a brand. 
Brand design is the art and science of finding and expressing that value to make brands unmissable and unmistakable across media. I love the analysis of packs on real shelves you always share on LinkedIn. Why do you find it as a valuable design tool? Well, I think that's simply because you can never fully appreciate the effect of the noise in a typical on-shelf situation. And that's probably true of online in a slightly different way. But if we just take the physical supermarket as an example, I've worked in this business for 30 years and it's still easy if you're not careful to underestimate the effect of being on a real shelf as opposed to your screen up against a few kind of perfectly rendered images of another pack. Packs are backwards, upside down, broken. All the competitors are there to view. And then you can see what really works. It is really a very different place in practice than what we would see on our screens when we're designing things. We've got to go into the real world because A, we care too much about brands and B, they do not exist on our screens. They exist in places where they're bought. So you have to go there to make your call on whether it's working or not. The reason I do that on LinkedIn is that because a supermarket has, I don't know, 30, 40,000 lines, I, I call this the footballer's birthday syndrome. I always remember, I don't know why I remember this, but when the players were coming onto the pitch and they would start talking about the game about to be played, uh, one of the companies would always say that either one of the 22 players or the manager or maybe the referee had a birthday, maybe today or yesterday or tomorrow. So if you work out the statistical probability of that happening, it's about 100%. So somebody on the field had a birthday today, yesterday or tomorrow is almost guaranteed. And I think it's like that in supermarkets. With all those number of lines and the number of redesigns going on, in any supermarket, in any given day of any, you know, a decent-sized supermarket, I'm going to find 10 brands that are being changed from one design to another. They're going to be in the middle of changing. They're going to have some old packs and some new packs. So that's what I do. It's a bit like being in the rainforest looking for a new species. You see something that catches your eye. Of course, what catches my eye is not going to catch every shopper's eye because I'm forensically trained graphics (laughs) and analyst. It's fascinating to see the brand change its clothes literally in front of you and to sort of have some thoughts on whether that's an improvement or not. Steve, you once said if your brand story is a book, then packaging is its cover. It shouldn't tell the whole story, but it must tempt, intrigue and persuade us enough to pick up and then buy the book. Do you consider yourself a packaging storytelling evangelist? (laughs) <laughs> yeah. Oh, God. Yeah, that quote. Yeah. I mean, it, it's a good quote and it, it, it's partially true. I think with the findings of how brands grow and the fact that people definitely don't care about brands as much as we like to think, you know, you've got to be a bit realistic about the level of storytelling you're going to be able to tell on a pack. We know the story. We put it together. We really slaved over every single part, the typesetting, the colors, the illustration styles, the ratio of scale and size and the way that varianting is done. You know, we've slaved over that to the nth degree. And of course, in the end, it's going to be looked at in a fraction of a second and decisions made. So to call that a story, I think we were probably a little bit guilty of overestimating the level of attention that people are going to spend on our lovely design. Nevertheless, there is a story there. If you can compose that story to be read in that fraction of a second, It doesn't have to be a big story. It just has to give you a very basic amount of information that still manages to make that brand seem like the best choice on that shelf for that particular customer or for all customers, in fact, because I think the idea of a target consumer is now also a little bit on the wane, shall we say. I mean, in the end, your success depends on a load of light buyers buying you, most of whom don't buy you very often and none of whom care about you. So if you know that, you think a little bit differently about how much love you're going to get feeling for your lovely story. So yeah, I'm a little bit less committed to the fact that the consumer is going to read all of this story. So you certainly shouldn't make it complicated. It has to be brutally simple. But you can tell a story to the subconscious with a logo, with a logo with a color background, with a logo with a color background, with a beautiful image of perhaps a a product. So yeah, I think the stories just have to be much, much simpler than we used to think they, they were. I still have a lot of faith in the fact that the subconscious is reading this story much faster than our conscious brain is. And we also have no access to what is just read. So we don't really know what it took from that glance at a pack. It took a lot more than we can possibly measure. And we certainly can't ask people what they saw. 
I think it's worth constructing the story as long as you don't think that the attention level is going to be rational attention. It's going to be very subliminal, but it still can cause some very real effects. Nobody's yet quite worked out that formula. You know, what is the right balance of all of the elements that you could call distinctive assets? Which are the most valid? Which are the most powerful? Which contribute most to the story? But You know, the story that we're putting together with design is so subtle. It's all about not just the elements, but the gestalt. It's the way in which they go together. And that is infinitely variable. So when you start testing those things in isolation, like here's the color, here's the typeface, here's this, I just think that isn't correct. That isn't how it's perceived in the brain. It just feels very unrealistic to me, even when you talk about the subconscious, because we just don't know how those things are being pieced together and what memory really is. So yeah, we're going in much closer and we are measuring subconscious effects, but not as they are actually exposed to our real brains in real life on real packs, on real ads. So I have still some skepticism about how well implicit research really is. I, I'm sure it, so it's better than asking consumers what they think, but I still don't think it's the full picture. What is the biggest mistake you see brands make when redesigning their brands and packaging? Which are some of the costly scenes of package design? Is there a story you would like to share? <laughs> well, yeah, I, I will share a story, but I'm going to, first of all, cite the classic example, the absolute top of the range killer crime against design was, of course, the Tropicana redesign of 2008, when all the distinctive assets were thrown away and instead a really nice own label design was substituted with a really trendy glass, a nice piece of modern typography and zero distinctive assets. Now, it looked lovely. Everyone agreed that and no one recognized it. And Tropicana lost 30% of their sales in the US. And so they changed it back. And not surprisingly, it recovered, you know, so it was a it was a costly mistake for a while, but it didn't kill the brand. It just highlighted that you can't just throw away things that consumers rely on to memorize what that brand looks like and to buy it on autopilot. You can't just do that. You just can't do it. It's an arrogance to think they're going to learn the new things because you changed them. And it's also an arrogance to think that trendy graphics are worth remembering because they're not. So the things that people can remember are not style. They remember concrete detail things. There's a straw in the orange. That's weird. You don't normally put straws in oranges. So the brand that did it has enormous benefit from that distinctive asset. And I think that single crime paved the way for how brands grow. I'm sure the work was being done for 20 years before that, but that allowed the breakthrough to happen where they said, look, this is what really happens when distinctive assets are thrown away. So you'd think that would never happen. And of course, what I've seen in, in my clients since that moment or since the, the work of uh, Byron Sharp and, and his team is that they're very conservative now about their assets. And actually, then they think everything is an asset, which is, of course, slightly the opposite problem, because often those things are not assets. They've just been there a long time. And the consumers are looking for recognition, in most cases, not how good it looks, just it's that brand or it's the one I normally buy. And yeah, we made a design change to a fairly big brand of tea in uh, about 2007, and it looked much, much better, but we darkened the tone of green and we allowed private label, which had copied it mercilessly. And so when we changed the pack to a, a more premium look, some of the assets were strengthened, but that color asset was darkened to make it look more premium. And we had a short-term issue there because just like Tropicana in a way, you know, the consumers bought more private label because they were confused because they thought that was the color of the brand they bought. And it was only a couple of tones darker but it was too dark for consumers to buy it with 10 microseconds of attention. So we saw a, a sales decline. And of course, we, we corrected it and made the green color much more similar to how it had been before. And that was, of course, the solution to the problem. I very much welcome, if you like, the, the discipline that How Brands Grow has brought to that idea of you can't just throw things away. You have to check that you can throw them away. And color is obviously one of those things that you would be very foolish to change too much. You never go to a different color, but even changing tone was enough. I wouldn't mean I would never change the tone of a color, but I would be very, very cautious about how much you turn that up or down. But you still see today brands changing a lot of stuff. So the message hasn't fully sunk in. And as I said before, there are also brands that are being way too conservative and saying everything's a distinctive asset when it, it really isn't. And Jenny talked about a lot of the ways in which distinctive assets can be improved, either by making them more the hero of the communication rather than being surrounded by clutter, or indeed by making them bigger or sharper or more in focus. So there's plenty of ways in which you can improve brand assets. And yes, there are brands that really don't have any. So you might need to create some or really make them work a lot harder. 
I think one of the interesting statistics I learned from a client a couple of years ago on a project, they're measuring what happens to sales immediately after redesigns on all their brands globally. And at the time, it, they reckoned that something like, I think close to maybe 65% of brands had a short-term decline whilst people adjusted to the new design. But I, I would say, well, what happened to the 35% that went up? Follow those. Don't follow the 65% that got it wrong because you can get it right. And now we know the rules. It's even easier to get it right. I, I would say that's an argument for doing more brand redesign, but just doing it correctly rather than <laughs> saying, hey, look, there's a problem here. Yeah, there's a problem because people aren't listening to the advice. They're actually just changing everything and hoping it works. How can brands future-proof their identity when brick and mortar is being replaced by e-commerce? That is the question facing pretty much our entire industry right now, you know, the digitalization of, of everything. And of course, the one thing that won't be digitalized in most cases is product, at least when it's food and drink. You can't actually consume a, a digital product <laughs> in that sense. But in terms of selling one, you certainly can. If point of sale is not a physical place, then that point of sale is where you have to play, right? And I still find it mildly amazing that online shopping, at least for food and drink, is, is like sort of the worst possible supermarket experience. You know, the things are lined up. They're in tiny little pictures. They're not even representative of the scale of the product that you're buying. They're not even together in categories. You don't see things next to each other that you would normally be able to choose between. So essentially, you're shopping from a list. You've gone 90% rational. You're not going to sort of, oh, I hadn't seen that before. Oh, that looks nice. I'll, I'll buy that. And I know brands have put a lot of effort into this. You know, Unilever's created a special sort of avatar, if you like, that can carry all the brand information without all the stuff you don't need. And that's a massive improvement. I, I wish somebody would put the same amount of attention into online shopping for groceries as they clearly do for online shopping for clothes. I don't know how to get to the situation where we can get online to be as rich an experience as the store. I think it's going to be a, a real challenge unless people want to go shopping with VR headsets on, which I don't really think, unless you make it very much worth their while. <laughs> um, well, maybe that's the future. But I think when, when that would happen, you could probably come up with something that was even better than the supermarket environment. And um, we have to change the way we think about that and create different forms of branding that balance the ability to inform with the ability to identify with the ability to seduce. But there is not much sign of that happening right now. Do you think the search for sustainable solutions will rewrite the rules of packaging design? I think if you add it to the ongoing digitalization of um, everything, if you take those two things together, and maybe we need a third thing, which is to actually do something about sustainability rather than just talking about it. I mean, we've had legislation and we've been talking about it for all of my career. I can remember the year 2000 legislation when I was living in the Netherlands, where they demanded a reduction in packaging materials. Everyone made that quite easily by just eliminating waste. But of course, packaging has already eliminated waste because it's economical to do so. But eliminating plastic is a whole new ballgame because everything in the world is preserved by this amazing material that we invented. So it's one of those questions that goes around in very big and deep circles. The evidence at the moment, after all of this time is that packaging doesn't appear to be reducing. Convenience, convenience, convenience <laughs> is beating sustainability out of the park every single time. And it is an absolute shame. And it's something that we just simply can't carry on doing. So I think it will change. But my God, it has to be convenient because without that, we ain't doing it. Or we have to introduce the, the stick and that's taxes. I think we have to remodel the entire economic model on which society is based before we can really get around to sustainability, which is a slightly bigger ask than just doing the sustainability, but we're going to have to do it. We're going to have to do it soon. What do you think designers need to learn today that will help us in the next 10, 20, or even 30 years? Well, it depends what you mean by designers and it depends what you mean by help. I mean, there are designers of, of everything. And right now, the most important need for designers, I think, is not packaging designers, but the designers of, for example, chemical reactions. You know, that's what I used to do. <laughs> We used to design <laughs> chemical reactions. Somebody needs to work out how to do that for this, yeah, plastic recycling, for example. That, that's a design job. Everything is a design job. Everything that's a problem can have a design solution. So I think we just need designers who work on bigger problems than decorating things and making them look nice, which is, for my sins and probably yours too, mostly what we do. We persuade people to buy things because they look nicer and they have a secret story behind the subliminal and we almost know how we did it. That's what we do today. 
So I think the real helping the world stuff isn't going to come from packaging designers. We will hopefully be able to use far more sustainable ways of creating what we do, both in terms of materials, in terms of process, in terms of buying. But the, the design needs to start at the system level, not at the how will packaging look differently in 10, 15, 20 years time. It's how will the entire system by which we live, work, eat, breathe, sleep and, and be how will that be redesigned? I think that's the question that needs to be answered. So I would say don't study graphic design, study something bigger. Uh, and that's what I'd advise <laughs> people with a design brain to do, because that's the real answer to your question about helping us. So you weren't mistaken by studying a PhD on chemistry? <laughs> uh, well, no, no. I, I mean, in the end, I think maybe. But I, you know, if you ask me to, what's the answer for recycling packaging as a result of what I knew about designing drugs in the 1980s? I'm afraid I don't really have much to help you there. Steve? What's your next adventure? <laughs> we are nearly 20 years old now, Osborne Pike, and I made a decision about two or three years ago that I really had to get some new blood into the business to form a, a sort of a more solid leadership team. And I've been doing that now for the last two or three years, and it, it's building very nicely. I actually get the chance to work in my own agency that's been radically transformed by the addition of some really excellent people. And now we have on a journey to grow in a controlled way, to have the right balance of skill set in the company and to work with partners. It makes sense if you don't want to become a huge agency to work with other small but brilliant little agencies. I think there's a whole new kind of way of working on the horizon, which will make it feel like we can be starting again. I'm starting again because I've got a lot of really good senior people helping me out running the agency now. I'm not the only one in charge, so to speak. I have a job rather than every job. That's given me a new lease of, of life and energy. So I think my next project is the same project, but it'll feel very different. Steve, thank you so much, not only for speaking brands, but also for thinking brands and breathing brands. So muchas gracias. <laughs> Thank you very much, Hernan. It's been my pleasure and I look forward to hearing it. I hope you have enjoyed this conversation as much as I did. You can check the episode notes for all the relevant links. I also invite you to follow me on Instagram and on my website, branderman.design. Follow the podcast in your favorite app so you don't miss the next episode of Branderman the podcast where we try to uncover how to make a positive impact on consumers, the market and society through package design.